Okay, we're live. <laughs> Here we go. So we are going to jump into this or that, what I'm going to call tree edition. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I do want to let you know, um, I guess I should introduce myself first. My name is Lara Milligan. <laughs> I am the natural resources agent for UF IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. I am based out of Brooker Creek Preserve up in Tarpon Springs. And as part of UF IFAS Extension, we get funding from all levels, federal, state, and local. Um, and as part of the USDA funding, we just have to ensure that we are not discriminating in any way, shape, or form. If you do have any issues or want to file a complaint, the way to do that is here on your screen. You can just do a search online for discrimination complaint form from the USDA. We'll kind of get the not fun stuff, the logistical stuff out of the way. I know you just want to learn about trees. I do also want to let you know this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, which I will promote and at the end of the webinar and share that resource with you. If at any point you have issues like I did with audio settings, um, you can click on the top left hand side of your screen. There should be an option for audio settings and you can test different speakers. I'm sorry, microphone. Nope. Speakers is all you will use. We cannot hear anything you say. Your mics are disabled, so don't worry about that. I will be doing Q&A, but at the very end, it's only me presenting, so I need to focus on my presentation. But please type in your questions. Just click on that as you have them, and it'll populate this little cue box for me that I can go back and reference at the end of the webinar. Also, feel free, I will be using the chat throughout for to keep it kind of interactive with some poll questions. Not the kind that popped up on your screen, but I'll just ask you to type in the chat. So stay tuned to that. But if you're messaging me in the chat, just be aware that I might not see that until the very end. And I may or may not use the raise hand feature throughout. Okay, so again, welcome to this or that tree edition. The tree species that we are going to go over today are the ones listed on your screen. These are the ones that you guys voted for at the beginning. So we'll look at cabbage palm versus saw palmetto, bald cypress versus pond cypress, longleaf pine versus slash pine, live oak or laurel oak, red bay or sweet bay, and red mangrove or black mangrove. This Presentation and the other ones, if you've participated in my previous ones that were kind of titling this or that, it is inspired by this field guide, which is called this or that, which is available for purchase. And I'll mention that at the end. So with that, we are just gonna jump right into our first species comparison. And I, you know, in a normal class, I'd probably constantly be asking you guys questions, but I don't want to overwhelm you with the chat. So the first one will be the cabbage palm versus the saw palmetto. So the cabbage palm is featured at the top of the screen in the saw palmetto on the bottom. So with each species comparison, I'm going to go through different ways that you can tell them apart. And hopefully you can be an expert and be confident in identifying them in the future. So the first thing that you want to look at is the frond of these palms. So the cabbage palm, some people might call it stable palmetto, which is actually the scientific name for it. What you want to note on the cabbage palm is that the leaf itself makes this very curved shape. Compared to the frond of the saw palmetto, that is very much like splayed out. It's very much a stiff looking leaf. And if you were to outline it, it would almost make a circle compared to the very folded appearance of the cabbage palm. Now, the other thing you can look for if you see that other kind of inset photo is that it has these little golden threads that come off of the cabbage palm. That's a really helpful identification characteristic that is absent in the saw palmetto. The other thing, if if that's not helpful for you. Another thing that you can look for is, you can look at is what we call the petiole. It's a fancy term for the leaf stalk or the part, right? The kind of the stem of prior to getting into the leaf blade. 
So on the cabbage palm, if you look at them, it's a very, very smooth edge compared to this very toothed edge of the saw palmetto. That's where it gets its name. You do not want to rub your fingers along the petiole of the saw palmetto. And the other thing you can look at is if you follow that petiole all the way up to where it goes into the leaf, on the cabbage palm, it almost makes a little arrow. It comes to a point and that point runs up into the leaf blade and that's what gives it that folding appearance. And contrasting that to the petiole of the saw palmetto, if you follow that up into where it runs into the leaf blade, you can see that it just kind of comes to an abrupt stop. So that's another thing that can be helpful when looking at the petiole. And kind of keep in mind this idea that the cabbage palm kind of comes to a point or an arrow, that would be helpful for this part. So when we look at the trunk of these two species, when they're mature, for a cabbage palm, right, we're looking at a big, massive tree. Salt palm meadows, maybe the tallest they'll get is like 20 feet tall if they're not in an area that sees a lot of prescribed fire or wildfires. The issue is when they're young, they can look very, very similar before the cabbage palm really shoots up out of the ground. So that little point that I mentioned with the cabbage palm, the leaf petiole goes into that blade and forms an arrow. You can also kind of think of that like it's gonna grow up into a tree and the saw palmetto stops. It's not gonna grow up into a tree. The other thing that's important to note is cabbage palms, it's just a singular trunk. It's gonna be one trunk, gonna turn into a big tree. Saw palmettos are multi-trunked species. So you can, I know this isn't like a very pretty picture. This is after a wildfire, but this without all the leaves in the way really helps to see that multi-trunk appearance of the saw palmetto. Okay, now there's one more, this is a little bonus, that could be very easily confused for the cabbage palm. I'm just gonna throw this in there. It's called the Chinese fan palm. This is not technically considered invasive yet. It's classified by the UF IFAS assessment as a caution species. They are continuing to watch it and do research to determine if it is, it will eventually be classified as invasive. It is kind of scattered throughout the state. It's only vouchered in a couple of counties in the state, but you can see it looks very similar to the cabbage palm. Like if you saw that picture of the tree, you'd be like, oh, it's a cabbage palm. But if you zoom in a little bit closer, there's a couple of things you can look for. I'll start on the left-hand side. One thing to look for is the number of, I've seen them referred to as segments, basically like those little rays <laughs> that come off of the leaf. They kind of divide it up. There's many more, there's 60 to 100 of those segments on this Chinese fan palm. There's less than that on the cabbage palm. So it's just, it looks like, I guess more intense in terms of those segments. The fruit is also very different. And if you look at the petiole, or again, that leaf stalk, the leaf stem of the Chinese fan palm, you can see these spikes. <laughs> it's like taking the saw palmetto petiole and like, putting it on steroids. So it's pretty intense. They tend to be more prevalent in younger species and, tend, and will basically can ultimately disappear when they're very mature, but that's something you can look for in a younger species. So just throwing that out there, we do have some right here in the preserve that we can reference. Okay, so, and I already mentioned the species. If you do happen to have this in your yard, right now we're just, our recommendation is manage it to prevent escape. We don't know for sure if it's invasive or not yet. Okay, so I mentioned that we will be doing random poll questions throughout. I know how difficult it can be to focus on online learning settings. So here's your true or false question. You can type your response in the chat. The cabbage palm is Florida's state tree.
I like to start off pretty easy with my poll question. So <laughs> looks like pretty, everybody got this correct. The answer is true. So I figured we'd start off with our state tree. And again, one species, well, I guess two species that are really easily and can be commonly confused, especially when they're young. Okay, so our next species comparison we're gonna go over is looking at the cypress trees. We have the bald cypress on the left and the pond cypress on the right. The main thing you wanna look for, kind of the dead giveaway, is looking at the leaves of these species. So you can see pond cypress is on the top, bald cypress is on the bottom. I tend to describe the leaves of the bald cypress as more feather-like compared to the pond cypress leaf, which is more, some people say needle-like, some say all-like, but it's basically like taking that, they call it two ranked when it looks like the feather of the bald cypress. And it's like all of those are kind of just pressed against that, that main vein or the main um, stalk of the leaf. So that's really the main difference between the two. Now, that being said, when these are young species, the pond cypress needles can look feather-like. It's not till they get a little bit more mature that they kind of get oppressed like they, to look like a needle, like you see on your screen here. So if you're looking at a young species, then perhaps look at the next, or consider the next couple characteristics that I'm gonna go over. So the next thing to consider is where you're seeing this species. And that's with the exception of if the tree is planted, this does not apply. This is in a natural setting. Bald cypress are typically found in moving waters compared to pond cypress, hence the name, tend to be in more stagnant waters like ponds. So also just consider the setting that you're in. For us here at Brooker Creek Preserve, right? We have a creek. I would not say it's a very fast flowing creek and we have a massive floodplain. The majority of the cypress that we have here are pond cypress. There are other areas that we have bald cypress. So it's not habitat, I would say it's not like a dead giveaway, but it can be helpful as something just to just factor in and consider. Now, this was like my fun find. We did some digging, we did some research because when I learned these species, I learned them as two different varieties of the same species. It seems now that the overall scientific consensus is that these are two totally different species, Taxodium distichum and Taxodium ascendens. The ascendens is for the pond cypress, and that's because when those needles are on the tree, they tend to kind of almost stick up, like they're ascending up into the air. So that's also something you can look for on the pond cypress. Now, another distinguishing characteristic that has made them two separate species is actually looking at the cypress knees. Not something we might like think about to look at when trying to identify a tree. The bald cypress knees are, tend to be greater than what they say four decimeters, which translates to 40 centimeters, which translates to about 15 inches. So they're typically gonna be taller than that. And they come to a very narrow, conical point, and they're covered in kind of this light, very tight bark. Compared to, you can see on the right, is pond cypress knees. These tend to be less than 40 decimeters, so less than 15 inches tall. They tend to be mound-like is probably the best way I've seen it described. You can kind of see they're a little bit more like ball-shaped at the top, and they tend to be covered in this more thick, barky appearance on the top. It's, it's kind of hard to see in these images, but you can, if you really focus in on those characteristics, like, oh yeah, those are really pointy. Those are a little bit more rounded. These are very tall um, on the bald cypress. These are shorter on the pond cypress. So that's something relatively new for me that I wanted to share with you. And I'm definitely gonna be paying more attention to that as I go about my journeys outside. Okay, so the next, comparison we're gonna do is longleaf pine and slash pine. Now I will say, I did a whole webinar on pines of Pinellas. If you want more than what I'm gonna share with you here, you can definitely check that out on our YouTube channel. 
one thing, kind of the main thing you could look for is needles. Now, of course, we can't always reach needles of pine trees. They can be incredibly tall, but they do shed their needles. So you can always look on the ground underneath the trees. I will also say longleaf pine and slash pine can occupy the same area and habitat. So if you happen to be in an area where you know they're mixed, perhaps pulling needles off the ground isn't the best way to ID a nearby tree. But it's a very simple game of counting. Longleaf pine needles come in bundles or fascicles of three. So you can see here, this is a little bundle. And if you count, one, two, three. Slash pine, on the other hand, come in bundles of three or two. I shouldn't say or, I should say and. Three and two. So you can see one, two, three, and then one, two. These will be found on the same tree. So it won't be like one tree happens to have two, one happens to have three. It'll be mixed within one tree. Of course, you might be like, well, if they both could have three, like how would you know? <laughs> so, I mean, if you're finding twos consistently, you're likely, in, and you're in Pinellas County, and it's pretty much longer than two inches, you're looking at a slash pine. <clears throat> the length overall, long leaf pine, it gets its name for a reason. The needles can be up to 18 inches long. 10 to 18 is what they typically say, about six or seven to 12 inches for the slash pine. So there's a little bit of overlap on length as well. So that's why uh, sometimes it's not the best thing to rely on, which is why I'm gonna tell you some other things you can look at. Now I will also say for longleaf pine, they can also very less often be found in bundles or fascicles of four. This I kind of think of like a little four leaf clover. So if you're ever out and about and you're counting needles, and you find one with four, just tuck that one in your pocket <laughs> and consider it some good luck for the day. The other thing you can look at is the bark. This is something I like to always stress when I'm doing tree ID, because if any of you take courses with my colleague James and he does more of the smaller plants, right? Plants don't have bark, trees have bark and they can be incredibly helpful for tree identification. On longleaf pine, we tend to say it's got more of an irregular appearance. It's classified as more of a reddish brown compared to an orange brown of the slash pine. I personally wouldn't rely on color, but you can see the slash pine bark is more of these big plates compared to, you can see the plates on the longleaf pine, but it's kind of scattered and more flaky throughout. That's what I mean by the irregular appearance. Sometimes this is very, very obvious, especially on more mature species. Other times, not so much. On juvenile trees, no way. <laughs> they all look very, very similar when they're young. So again, sometimes you'll see this irregular bark of a longleaf pine, like for sure, I don't even need to look up. I don't need to count, that's a longleaf pine, but sometimes not so obvious. So can be helpful, can not. This is one of the hardest species, probably even professional foresters struggle with this. Now I know this picture on the left is upside down. <laughs> There's a reason for that. The other thing you could look at is cones. The cones of longleaf pine are significantly larger than the cones of slash pine. You can think about longleaf pine, everything's bigger, fatter, longer on longleaf pine. The cones, the reason I put this one upside down is because they tend to hang upside down on the tree. They can get anywhere from like eight to 10 inches big compared to like, you know, three to six or seven inches on the slash pine. If size is not, you know, if you look up and you're like, I don't know, I don't know. Color can also be helpful. The longleaf pine cones tend to be a little bit more like drab and dull in their, in their brown coloration. And slash pine cones, when they're fresh, they're very, very shiny and this very like bright tan color. They're a beautiful, beautiful cone. Typically, you know, when we're finding them on the ground, they may have lost that coloration a little bit. Now the, the bonus feature is a little trick that you can do when you're out and about, which is to just, oops, sorry about that. Which is to put your hand up. I don't know what we call this, I forget. Hang loose, I think is officially what this means. But um, 
you can look up at where the twig, where the needles emerge from the twig, basically. And you wanna look up and see if, if that thickness of the twig where the needles emerge is thicker like your thumb or skinnier like your pinky. So remember I said everything on longleaf pine is bigger, fatter, longer. So if it looks more really thick like your thumb, it's likely you're looking at a longleaf pine. And if it's skinny like your pinky, then you could be looking at a slash pine. Again, this isn't like, <laughs> you're not gonna see this in any dendrology book or anything like that. This is just kind of something I've learned throughout the years that could be helpful. Another thing to consider, this is really important for any tree species is, is like, is this tree even found here? <laughs> so if you're in South Florida, I know most of you are probably joining from Pinellas County, but if you're in South Florida and you're like, oh, I think that's a longleaf pine. I'm here to tell you it's likely not, <laughs> just based on where this species historically is found. Slash pine, you can see kind of branches. It can be found in South Florida, but more along the coast, not as much in the Everglades area for obvious reasons. But uh, again, it's just a helpful thing to consider is where are you? And then could that tree even be found there? Okay, and a last little bonus on pines, because I love them. This is basically my Pines of Pinellas program in like five minutes. <laughs> uh, the last, there's only three pine species that we have here in Pinellas County, at least that are naturally occurring. The last one is sand pine. This one looks very, very different from the other two species, which is why I didn't include it. You can see the overall structure if you look at the uh, top right image, it looks more like almost like a, a giant Christmas tree. It retains all of its lower branches, so it looks very different from our pines that lose those lower branches. The needles are in sets of two, and they're very small, <laughs> only a couple inches, and they kind of have a twisty appearance to them. And then their cones are much smaller as well. So it's a very, very cool, but very different pine from our other two species. Okay, y'all still with me? Let me, let me, I probably have a poll question coming up soon, but let's get like a yes, I'm still with you in the chat <laughs> or no, I've snoozed off and you've lost me. Okay, I've got like three people with me still, so that's great. We'll keep chugging along. <laughs> okay, so this is probably honestly the number one thing that I get asked about or emailed pictures of, is this a laurel oak or is this a live oak? So we're gonna help you figure that out. So the first thing that you wanna look at and feel are the leaves. The leaves of live oak are very, very thick and leathery compared to the leaves of laurel oak. I always, I hope I'm, this is, appropriate to say, but I always think of like Laurel like a lady and she's very like, everything about the Laurel Oak is like prim and proper, the, her overall structure and her leaves are, are like, how do I want to put it? They're just not as thick and leathery as the live oak. It's a thinner leaf. It's more fragile if you want to say that. I can say that. I'm a female. Um, it's just a very, very different leaf overall. Thin, the coloration is something else you can look for. It's not super apparent in these images, but the underside of the live oak leaf is covered in these tiny, tiny hairs that gives it this like dull green coloration on the underside. And while the underside of the laurel oak leaf is, you know, you can kind of see it's a lighter shade of green, but it's still a very vibrant green because it doesn't have those hairs that gives it that dull appearance. So thickness of leaf is gonna be, important and then the flexibility like if you can really flexible flex the leaf it's probably a laurel oak and live oak is very very stiff now that being said there's many many species of oaks that we have here in pinellas county so this isn't like an end-all be-all but it can be helpful for identifying between these two species okay and then when we look at again bark something that can be really helpful that we might overlook. The bark of live oak is known for being very, they call it deeply furrowed. It's a very, very rough bark. 
And if you look, compare it to the laurel oak bark, you can see it's rough. It's got some little fissures in it, but it's not nearly as rough and deeply furrowed as the bark of live oak. So sometimes alone, you can just look at the bark and be like, that's for sure a live oak. And the last thing you can look at is if you have acorns available to view whether they're on the tree or they've fallen down on the ground and haven't been consumed by the squirrels is just the overall shape. So live oak acorns tend to be elongated. You can see on the left, it's like more of an egg shape compared to the laurel oak acorn, which tends to be a little bit more flattened and you can see a little bit more dull in appearance. The live oak acorns are this beautiful like amber brown. So color and length of the acorn can be helpful as well. Those couple things, I didn't include pictures of the overall structure of the trees. There's so much I could have included. But again, I, I always think of like laurel like a lady. The branches tend to be very straight on the laurel oak. And if you think of live oaks, especially the old ones, they're like, they have what we call decumbent branching. So they can go up and even go down. And they have this like insane structure of the tree and the branches. So live oaks are like alive and moving <laughs> and laurel oaks are a little bit more straight. Okay. Oh, and I'm sorry, I just saw Kim's comment. I meant to mention this at the beginning. On, should be on the bottom of your screen, there should be an option for a closed caption icon. By default, we always have it turned on, but you can turn it off by clicking, it should say CC on the bottom of your screen, you should be able to turn that off. And thank you, Kim, I'll, I need to add that in the introduction. So here's my next pop quiz question. True or false, trees that have similar common names, for example, Sweet Bay and Red Bay, always mean the trees are related. Oh no, I'm sorry, Kim. We need to look into that because that's, I know some people have been able to turn it off and others haven't. So I don't know if it's the browser you're using or what, but we will look into that. Okay, you guys are good. The answer is false. I get asked this question a lot whenever I'm out doing guided hikes, you know, I'll introduce red bay tree and then we'll go and see a sweet bay and they'll say, oh, they're both bays, so they must be related. And that is one of the reasons that a lot of people rely and stress scientific names because it just helps us to really differentiate between species. So that was my little segue into our next species comparison, which is the red bay versus the sweet bay. Some people call sweet bay the sweet bay magnolia. You might have heard of it called that because you can see the genus is magnolia. So the first thing, sorry, the first thing to look at is the leaves again. On both of the leaves are kind of this dark green on top with a paler underside. The underside of Sweet Bay is much more of a silvery, almost blue color compared to, again, more of like a dull green on the Red Bay. The Red Bay, has that dull appearance because of tiny, tiny hairs. The sweet bay is more of like a glaucous, like a waxy coating. So you can see this little spot on the sweet bay leaf. That's where I rubbed my finger. It'll actually like come off the leaf. So that's one little test you could do. The other thing that you can look for is the galls or the psyllid wasps that attack the red bay leaf. I shouldn't say attack. <laughs> they lay their eggs in the leaf and the leaf reacts in this way. And sometimes that's like a distinguishing characteristic of the red bay. You'll see these like pimples or warts all over the leaves. So that can actually be helpful for identification. Now, in terms of the flowers, again, well, I should say that these are not to scale. So the red bay flowers are, are tiny, tiny flowers. It's probably like half an inch big. And they're anywhere from like a pale green, kind of creamy white color compared to these massive flower, I shouldn't say massive, but several inch 
big flower, much bigger than the red bay tree, flower of the sweet bay. Again, it's in the magnolia family. You probably all know of southern magnolia with the big white flowers as well. They're aromatic, they're beautiful, they're big, they're showy, they're white. So if you see them in flower, there's really no, no way to get these two confused. And I guess I should also say both the leaves are aromatic as well. So like, unless you have a really good sense of smell and can tell the difference between the two, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on smell for the leaves, but that is something else fun that you could explore using all of your senses. The other thing that's dramatically different is the fruit of these species. So you can see the red bay, it's a one seeded droop here, kind of this bluish purple color. It's a really, really pretty color compared to the sweet bay, which I've seen this described in many ways. I think cone-like is the best way to describe it. It's this cone-like fruit that holds these very, very bright red seeds. No way to confuse those two. Again, similar if you're familiar with the Southern Magnolia, it's got a similar fruit to that because it's in the Magnolia family, but very, very different fruit between these two bay trees. Okay, and I, don't, I think this is the last comparison that we have. So we are going to, I guess, go coastal for this last one. We're gonna look at the red mangrove versus the black mangrove. The first thing to consider is where you are finding this species. Red mangroves are typically found directly along the coast, like right on the water's edge compared to the black mangrove that tends to be found a little bit more inland. I say tens because that's not always the case. The reproduction of these two species, so you're probably familiar, let me go back to this slide, with this structure on the red mangrove, this is like a living plant. Once it falls from the tree, it's, it's already growing. Wherever it lands, it could establish there. The black mangrove fruit, which you can see here, it has to get established on dry ground in order to grow and reproduce. So it tends to get washed up on shore. And so that's why they tend to be found a little bit more inland. Then when we look at the roots, again, totally, totally different. The red mangrove roots, we're probably all familiar with them. They have these prop roots. They tend to be reddish in color. It helps prop the plants up out of the ground. And the roots of the mangroves, they send up these tiny finger-like projections called nematophores. It aids with gas exchange for living in a very wet area. But again, these are totally different structures that separate these two species. And then in terms of the leaves, so the leaves can look similar from a distance. Excuse me. They tend to be like a brighter green on top, duller on the underside. The black mangrove, you can kind of see that it's even a little bit more fuzzy or pale on the underside of the leaf. And that's because it's covered in dense, dense hairs on the backside of the mangrove, black mangrove leaf, compared to the red mangrove that lacks those hairs altogether. The black mangrove also exudes salt. It's one of the ways that it an adaptation, adaptation for living in saltwater environment. So the surface of the leaves will have these tiny little salt crystals. I learned this, our teacher had us use all of our senses all the time. So we actually got to like lick the leaves and tell no, it's very, very salty. You would not find that on the red mangrove. And then of course, I mean the fruit, if they are in fruit, they look very, very different. Okay, Whew, we did it. And we still have time for questions. <laughs> and that's perfect. I wanted to keep it as a short lunch and learn. So thank you if you stuck with me this far. I just wanna wrap up with a couple different things. We always like to talk about ways you can help and then some other resources for you. Oh, that slide keeps advancing. So removing invasive species is always helpful. Sorry. <laughs> Planting native trees, restoration events, specialty license plates, get involved, contact your elected officials. <laughs> okay, I'll let it advance there.
but those are all different ways. Anything we can do to support our native tree species is helpful, whether that's removing invasive plants, planting native plants, doing big tree planting events, any type of restoration. If you don't have land, if you're in a multifamily housing or just don't have the ability or rights or approval to plant trees where you are, um, you can support financially other groups that are doing that. So there's lots of ways you can help. And just by you participating in this webinar is helpful. If you're more of a reader or just like to go back and reference things, I do have several blogs that correspond with this content. It's basically taking this and putting it into word form in a blog. So if you're not subscribed to our blog site, if you just go to blogs.ifis.ufl.edu, then you can search for Pinellas County and then you can find, and you can search for my name specifically, Lara Milligan, and search for blogs that way. I mentioned before that we have all of our webinars archived on our YouTube channel. So if you wanna go back and reference or learn more, they are on demand whenever is convenient for you. And you can, it's easier probably just to do a word search. We have a bit.ly link on the screen, but if you do a search online for Pinellas County Extension YouTube, it should be the first thing that pops up. Make sure it's extension because obviously Pinellas County government itself also has a YouTube channel. So in addition to the longer webinars, we have these short webinars. That's part of our this or that series. They're anywhere from two to three minute long videos that again, just highlights these, basically what I just did, but in little snippet form. If you wanna go back and reference a particular species comparison, you can do that on our YouTube channel as well. I mentioned this is inspired by our this or that field guide which is a real thing. <laughs> Me and my colleague, James Stevenson, put this together. It's available for purchase through the UF IFAS Extension Bookstore. Um, it's $18. If you don't wanna pay for shipping, you can come visit me at Brooker Creek Preserve. Our nature store has them for sale, so you can avoid the shipping that way. And come enjoy a nice hike in Pinellas County's largest remaining natural area. I do wanna say these proceeds do not benefit James or myself directly. The funds go into our program, our natural resources programming funds, so we can offer some more fun and exciting programs for you. And if you're into podcasting, I do a monthly podcast with my colleague in Polk County. It's called Naturally Florida. You can just find us at naturallyfloridapodcast.com or search on any of your podcast platforms for Naturally Florida. And subscribe, and we'd love to have you tune in and listen. We just released a new episode today on coyotes. And if you haven't already left me, I am going to launch a little wrap up poll and then I'll take five minutes for Q and A. So while you guys are filling out the poll questions, I'm gonna pull up the Q and A box. Okay. And I don't see any questions there. I'll also scroll through the chat. Sandra mentioned Brazilian pepper. Yes, it's invasive. That is absolutely correct. Probably one of the worst invasive tree species that we have in the state. So again, please click on the, if you have a question after the poll, click on the Q&A and type it in there. And then I will do my best to respond. Okay. okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat so far. Okay, here. Can you clarify, clarify about the palms? Does the cabbage palm have barbs? on the fronds. Okay, good question. And I, I'm sorry if I did not make that clear. So the cabbage palm, our native palm tree, our state tree, table palmetto, does not have barbs on the frond. Saw palmetto has, we would call it more like these little tiny teeth along the edge that will not grow up into a tree. The invasive, it's not invasive yet, the species that is not native that we are concerned about is the Chinese fan palm. 
and that one does have spikes along the petiole. So I hope that clarified and sorry if I made that confusing. Sorry. <coughs> Are jacaranda trees, I'm assuming, uh, you're asking if they are invasive. So I'm actually gonna <laughs> pull up. Oh, and I'm gonna end the poll. Oops. I'm gonna look right now on our UF IFAS assessment and let you know the official answer. <laughs> Oops. It is. No, it is not considered invasive. Not a problem species according to the UF IFAS assessment, yeah. Okay, if we see a Brazilian pepper in a public area, is there a number we should call or is there a state eradication program? Okay, so that's a great question. So it depends where you are. So if you're within like a city park or something like that, you can call the city. Sorry, there's an airplane going through. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all can still hear me. We have windows wide open here. Um, you'd want to call your city or you can call the county and depending a lot of them have either an arborist like a city arborist or like we have an urban forestry department so you could call them so just depend where you are but it definitely never hurts to call and report that oh and now we open the Q&A is red bay what you can use to cook yes yeah, so the red bay leaf is related to the bay leaf that we all use in commercial cooking. It's, <coughs> sorry, it has similar properties. So I will say we do not encourage people to go out to a city park or a county park, especially not a preserve that's prohibited um, to harvest those leaves, but it is related in that same, in the cooking world. Okay, I've heard about oaks hybridizing. Is there a way to tell? if you are looking at one that has. Excellent question. And that's kind of one of the things that, that we use in, in the forestry world. If we're ever looking at an oak and we're like, I've got no clue. We're just like, must be a hybrid. So yes, they're hybridizing. It's still happening. The only way to really like, there's no way to confirm. I take that back. There's of course the technology to confirm, but like us as a general citizen going out, there's not really a way other than making the observation like, oh, it has characteristics of a water oak and a live oak. So aside from that, there's no real way to confirm, but it is a thing. I don't understand why developers can pick up the cabbage palms. Yeah, there's, in terms of development, that's, I mean, I don't want to get, there's different ordinances and preemptions at the state and local level <clears throat> that determine what developers can and cannot do. So that just really depends where you are. But I will say it never hurts to use your voice and let your elected officials know how you feel about certain things. Okay. Point Vienna, invasive. No, I know that is not invasive. But all of you guys, if you just do a search online for UF IFAS assessment, it should pop up and you can type in either the common name or the scientific name. And it'll, if you scroll down, it'll give you information based on North, Central and South Florida. Because there are some species that are classified as invasive in some parts of the state, but not others yet. Okay, and I see it's now one minute after one. So I do want to respect everybody's time. Thank you if you're still with me. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope that you will join us for future webinars or check us out on YouTube. And I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week.